everyone, and welcome to our Faith in Action Forum. My name is Kelly, and I serve as one of the associates here on staff, focusing on formation and welcoming ministries. Um, these forums have been a really exciting collaboration between our faith formation team and our community engagement steering committee. And so to open us up, I'll actually be opening with a prayer provided by Gwen Crichton, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. And then I will pass things over to Steve. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Creator God, giver of life and love, you created all people as one family, each made in your image, and called us to live together in harmony and peace. Surround this nation, this commonwealth, and metropolitan Richmond with your love, grace, and mercy as we face the challenges and trauma of gun violence that violate your creation. Bind, a, bind up the wounds of all who suffer from and per perpetrate gun violence, those injured, maimed, and disfigured, those who have lost their freedom and lives, those left alone and grieving. Comfort the brokenhearted, impart courage to the hearts of those who feel helpless. Empower us to take life-giving actions and justice. Come, O oh come, Emmanuel, stir up your power and make haste to help us restore what is broken and give us hope and confidence to find new ways to live peaceably in your world. Through Jesus Christ's name, amen. And now I will pass things over to Steve Otto, who is on the Community Engagement Steering Committee. Hi, everybody. It's, it's great to see everybody here this morning with um, this time of year and the weather and all of that. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I'm Steve Otto on the Community Engagement Steering Committee. I see some friends from our racial justice and healing group here. And um, I've been working with the Faith in Action group to put this together with our guests today. I want to do two business things before we turn it over to them. Um, if you haven't signed in with the sign-in sheet, there's one at the back, there's one at the front. Um, the Faith in Action group really appreciates that. And then I want to draw your attention to the program on your table. This has been carefully designed so that if you tear at the perforation, you can seize the opportunity to fill out an evaluation of this session and this Faith in Action series. And also, if you have any resources regarding gun violence that are important to you or have been meaningful to you, we'd like you to take this opportunity to, to jot them down. If you bring that piece of paper up to the front, I'd be happy to collect it. Um, we can make those resources available to everyone. So that's how the program works. Rip it in half, and we thank... We have to thank our communications staff for the um, extra work. So gun violence, um, communities across the country are struggling with this and trying different approaches. Hopewell has adopted a framework that is yielding good news. And we don't hear about good news very often. So I'm delighted to welcome here today Major Donald Reed, who is Deputy Chief, Hopewell Police Department, and also Mr. Maurice Washington, who works with the Real Life Consultants, and they partner on this program along with other people. Major Reed is gonna start us off with an overview using PowerPoint, and I turn it over to you. I'm gonna be the guy hitting the button, so if you wonder what I'm doing, I'm hitting next. Good morning. Can everyone hear me in the back? Excellent. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Donnie Reed. I'm uh, the Deputy Chief of Police with Hopewell, and uh, I've been in Hopewell now 17 years. I've worked uh, narcotics, investigations, patrol, special investigations, and then just kind of went through the ranks to where I currently work as Deputy Chief. Um, but I've been in that area my entire life. I currently reside in Prince George. I do have five kids, ranging from 11 to 24, um, so we stay pretty busy with that. Um, and I do want to have Maurice introduce himself before we get started as well, kind of talk about his background a little bit. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Maurice Washington. Um, I currently work for the Real Life Program, the Violence Prevention Coordinator for Real Life, in partnership with the City of Hopewell. Also, soon to be working in RHA and uh, the Tri-Cities. Um, that's our approach that, that we're trying to handle right now. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm father of five as well. <laughs> father of five as well. Um, 
also have um, formerly incarcerated, formerly incarcerated, uh, also uh, somebody that's in recovery, been recover in recovery for five years, and that's how I got introduced to the Real Life program. We have 12 recovery houses in the city of Richmond, um, and that's 11 male houses and one female house. So we, uh, we accept people coming from incarceration, uh, people suffering from homelessness as well, and people just battling addiction. So we give them homes, help them with jobs. Um, they go through intensive courses in order to help change the, their ways of thinking. And um, I'm a graduate of that program as well. So um, I was introduced to the program, graduated. It took about six months to graduate, um, became a house manager of the program and a house manager, someone to manage one of the houses. And from then um, I became a counselor um, at the program. And I've been with Real Life since 2019. So going on, going on what? Going on five, what, five years, four years? I lose count, but yeah. <laughs> um, so, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and we got we got called to this work uh, about a year ago now. We started um, really really learning more about gun violence. The director of the program wanted to get involved in gun violence, and we was introduced to GVI, which is Group Violence Intervention. It's um, the number one crime reduction strategy in the country. So we wanted to to learn more, and we end up um, trying to bring it to Richmond. And we end up getting the funding and everything to come to Richmond, but some some things happen, and we end up, you know, not coming here. But we're still working on that part. But um, Hopewell gladly um, seen the program and wanted us to come there, and we did. So we've been working at Hopewell ever since then. Um, I've been through numerous trainings um, as far as for trauma, um, gun violence. Uh, recovery. Um, I, I can't name all the trainers I've been in, but um, been a lot of been a lot of trainers in order to, to do this work. And this type of work calls for someone who's been there and you know been on both sides, you know, of the law. You know, been been where these people are that we're trying to work with, so that we'll be able to relate to them. So that's how I got, you know, called to do this work. And it was it was a calling. You know, I'm I never thought I'd be doing this, but that's what I'm doing. So yeah, I, that might be a, a drawn out introduction to myself, but you know that that's who I am. Thank you. So GVI is programming that works to reduce homicide and gun violence. It minimizes harm to a community by focusing on deterrence rather than enforcement. The key word there is deterrence. We will never arrest our way out of a, a crime increase, okay? Um, so we've had to learn and shift gears along the way to take on a different mindset and focus on meaningful relationships and partnerships to help us be successful in reducing violence overall and reducing the fear of crime in, your, in, our, in our jurisdiction. But this works in any jurisdiction, okay? Hopewell is not a one-off. A lot of you know cities are, are, are seeing these types of increases that we kind of experienced in 2022. And what that is is it's community members with a moral authority over group members that deliver a credible moral message against violence. Maurice, Maurice and his partners, they have the credibility that we do not have um, as an officer. We are perceived as those enforcement figures. We're often seen in, in, in the light of, we're here to arrest a family member, we're here to, to enforce a law that has been broken. Um, and then, so having that, that credibility that we have with our community partners gives them the edge to kind of build and foster those relationships. Now we're still in the support role and we're still organizing community events and engagement opportunities to strengthen um, those relationships, but we can't do it by ourselves and we know that. And, a lot, and I think that's where a lot of uh, agencies fall short is they think they can, but you can't. We, we need the community support. We need those stakeholders and those vested members of society to help us. So I just wanna talk a little bit about this. Um, even in communities with high rates of violence, very few uh, are involved in homicides and shootings. Group members 
for gun violence. Group members are involved in as much as 70% of homicide and gun violence. Think about that. Group members. And what's also unique to that, 0.06% of your community is a problem. 0.06. That's, that's that little, little sliver right there in the middle of that, that circle. That is your problem within a community. So it's not that much. Um, so that's kind of where you've got to start thinking and where you've got to target, where we've got to target that population. And those are the individuals that are most likely to shoot or be shot. And those are the ones we want to reach. When I say target, it's not target to arrest. It's target to bring them out of that lifestyle, to save their lives, to give them other opportunities and other resources that we'll talk about along the way. Yes, ma'am. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on that just next. Yes, ma'am. I figured that was going to be a question, so I think it might be the next slide. Um, so the term group refers to any social network whose members commit violent crimes together. All right. This can include anything from chapters of organized national gangs or uh, loose neighborhood crews. Other names that associate uh, with a group is gangs, posses, sets, crews, or blocks. So a lot of what we deal with in Hopewell are... Uh, more of a, a neighborhood group or an area grouping. They, some do have ties to some national gang organizations, but they're not as structured. Um, and, and when you're getting into that nationally uh, uh, recognized gang, they, they have a hierarchy, you know, but these neighborhood crews, they, they really don't. They really don't have direction. They don't have a code to follow. They don't have a set of rules. So it makes them a little more dangerous, you know? It makes them a little more dangerous, at least with the national style gangs, they're given orders. If they don't follow those orders, they're held accountable for it. Um, is that right? Absolutely not. Um, it's actually kind of scary. But uh, so what we're dealing with are individuals that are a little more reckless in that regard. So, yes, sir. So how this all began was uh, in 2022, we had a, approximately a 76 percent increase in violent crime in the city of Hopewell, 11 square miles. 23,000 residents, we had 76% increase in crime, violent crime. Our homicides were through the roof. Um, we were pouring resources at it. We were, we were increasing our enforcement efforts. Uh, we had federal assistance. We had state assistance helping us uh, patrol the streets, high visibility. We just weren't making any progress. Um, and it was obvious that we had group violence taking place. A lot of our shootings were retaliatory. Whether the, the initial incident occurred in the city of Petersburg or not, it, they were coming into Hopewell with that. And it, it was scary. I mean, our, our community was, was rightfully upset, rightfully upset. Um, so we've, we've, we had to shift gears. Um, Delegate Kerry Corner uh, had, had known about real life and their efforts in Richmond and, and GVI. We were familiar with GVI. We were actually researching the program, so and we were creating some um, plans to, to unroll that in our community when uh, Delegate Corner introduced us to Dr. Scarborough from real life, and that's how we met Maurice and that team. And um, six, six months, so January we started our process, a six-month process to implement Project SAFE. Project SAFE is safe, alive, and free. That's what our program is called in the city of Hopewell. Project SAFE, safe, alive, and free. And so that six month process was pretty tedious. We spent a lot of time together building that relationship and getting other stakeholders involved to, to unroll in June of 2023. So. And so we're gonna kind of we're going to get a little bit through this, and then we're going to kind of field some questions regarding this so we can kind of uh, fill in some gaps. Because um, death by PowerPoint, we don't want that, right? Um, so our process was developed in the framework, the vision, those relationships, and those partnerships, getting us all in the same room. Uh, we then got involved with the National Network for Safe Communities. They, they did all our trainings. They flew in from different uh, areas th throughout the country. We, uh, we took part in what they call GVI University. Um, it wasn't just police. It was community members. It was community res resilience. We had so many different factors in these trainings that took place so we could all get a better understanding of, uh, of how the program worked. One of our biggest obstacles internally in our agency was educating our officers and giving them the correct vision because when you're dealing with police officers that, that don't 
understand that community inference. They, they, they don't initially want to take a softer approach. But when nothing else works, you've got to shift gears. You've got to make that change. You've got to, you've got to put forth the effort. So that was probably internally our biggest struggle, um, but we were able to, 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 to kind of get that buy-in through the education piece and, and get them on board. Um, we then created our executive board, which is uh, Delegate Kerry Corner, myself, uh, Dr. Scarborough from Real Life, um, uh, city, two city council members, uh, various stakeholders in the community, John Randolph Foundation. We created a, a board that could oversee the programming um, and, and kind of how we rolled this out. Um, and then uh, we did uh, extensive training. Uh, we did community resilience training, and Maurice can kind of talk more to that. And then we got into what we're going to kind of field some questions and explain a little bit more about is our weekly shoot and review meetings and our custom notifications. So uh, I thought it might be really interesting for people to have you, uh, thanks for that background, by the way, it's really helpful to get the context. I thought it would be interesting for people to learn about the process you guys go through at a kind of granular level, starting with these weekly review meetings. The police know who these group members are. They are aware of the activities around emerging threats. How does this work when you have these weekly meetings? So uh, basically, uh, each week we meet with, it's me, myself, and um, Hopewell the Police Department. Also, Prince George is starting to, to join, and Petersburg is starting to join. We have Chesterfield that, that gets on as well. Um, the AG's office, probation, the head of the school security just, just started, the principal of the school down there. So everyone pretty much that's basically at the table who, who will know some of these people that we're working with and knows what's going on or, or that could help with what's going on. So um, we have everyone in the Zoom meeting and then we uh, hope well they talk about any shootings in the past week. So if there was an incident, um, we talk about the incident and we see if it's group related um, and it might be something that's retaliatory. So if we identify something that's retaliatory, somebody, something that we need to, that we feel that it would be effective if they, we went to go speak to them on the, on the real life side, the community side, and then we activate and then we do that. Um, if we see something that, that seems to be enforcement, then the law enforcement acts on that part. And that's the basis of it. Um, you know, if we identify some people, um, we, we go into the custom notification. Um, we, Basically, we see if we need to custom anybody. Um, and what a custom notification is, is um, we, once we identify the individuals that are at risk of shooting somebody or being shot, we have, once we identify one of those people, we come to them, me, a community member, and law enforcement, um, and we go to them and let them know that we care about them, we want to see them safe, we want to see them alive, we want to see them free. Law enforcement explains to them, you know, I'm not, you're not in trouble, I'm not here to lock you up. You know, I'm here because we care about you. You know, we want to want to see you something, do something different. And the community member explains to them, um, it could be someone. We we have individuals that volunteer um, in the churches near in Hopewell. Um, maybe a principal in the school. It's a custom notification because we try to approach each person differently. You know, how we feel would be the most effective to reach them. It might be a mother that lost their child. And they can explain to them, like, you know, we're, we're in the community. We, I know you since you was growing up. And we know that you're involved in things. And we don't want to see you shooting anybody. You know, we don't want to see you being shot. You know, and these individuals could be someone who hang, Jay could have got shot. And we know that John hangs out with Jane, with Jay. So we know John and Jay are, you know, John is at risk of going back and retaliating or he's at risk of shooting somebody, um, of getting shot himself because his friend just got shot. So he's now at a high risk of gun violence. And, and that's where the group comes in. Um, it could be a group of two people, two or three people could be considered, considered a group. You know, somebody and their friend name pop up a lot in um, suspected shootings or suspected targets. You know, it, it, that's where the shooting reviews are. We, we come up with people who are at risk and we try to intervene. And, um, and my part, my, when I tell the guys when I go see them, 
I'm here, I'm here to help them um, in any kind of way I can. That's why it's so important to build the, the framework that you see at the top, the framework and the partnerships. Because once I build a relationship with them, um, I want to come see them weekly. If it's not, if it's not me, it's somebody else. We, um, we have different life coaches. And we call them, we give them intense, intensive life coaching. So we call them every week, you know, a couple of days out of the week. And we, we check on them, we visit them, we just build. It's all about building a relationship with these guys. And so that they can have a positive influence in their life, because some of them don't have that. You know, if they want a job, we connect them to a job. We, I, um, I recently took a guy grocery shopping. You know, his kids need pampers, we take them to get pampers. We go out to eat with them every week and we build that bond with them, you know, and um, it's somebody that they can call whenever they're into anything, they can just give us a ring, and they have that person in, in their corner. And, and that's what this is all about. You so, know? Maurice, this, yes, this first meeting, after you guys figure out who you want to go, have a, it's called a custom notification. Mm -hmm. what, it's the first, what is the role of the police at this meeting? So, let me back up just a hair. So prior to um, us unrolling this program, we, we did a pretty extensive uh, intelligence gathering piece with our crime analysts, members of National Network of Safe Communities, Maurice and his team, our investigators, myself, sat in a room. Um, we used data analytics to determine a, a group that our, our 0.06% um, where the problems were occurring, we identified that group. Um, because those were going to be the ones most likely to be shot or do the shootings, which it turned out as we implemented the problem, members from that list that we had created were involved in shootings. So it's, th this works. The data analytics, it's, it's proven. These statistics are proven. But when we get into the custom notification piece, one, we're more of a security component for our, our community members, but we want them to know that we care as a law enforcement agency. We care about our community. We care about our community members. We want to make that initial introduction, um, and then we step out of the way. It's simple as that. If they need us, we're there. However, we're out of the picture. We want that to be uh, personal. We want that to be meaningful and purposeful. And if we're standing over the shoulder of community members trying to speak to folks that we've either arrested or could potentially have some enforcement action with, we're reducing their credibility. So we utilize their expertise and their credibility to, to, to further those customs, but we just make that introduction, let them know that we care, we're not there to arrest them. You know, we, we will if we have to. He talked about the enforcement piece. There, there is an enforcement component there if, if the behavior continues or it reaches an element that where we need to step in. Nobody's getting a free pass, but we are trying to change behaviors. And so if we're, we're literally, we walk up, we introduce ourselves, we introduce them, we make that contact. Hey, we, we care about you. We want to see you succeed. We want to see you be you know healthy in our community. And then we get out the way. So let's shift back to you then, Maurice. This, um, the meetings you describe, I mean, violence comes from somewhere, right? It sounds like what you are doing is working with them to uncover what some of those sources of violence are and solve them. Is that, can you give some examples of what some of the sources of violence are? Most definitely. Um, well, it's a two part, well, a lot of times um, we, work with, we work with that um, as far as the sources through the curriculum that we came up with. Um, the numerous trainings that we've been through, we came up with a curriculum directly for these guys. So um, in, cert in certain in certain instances, we might speak on why we're there. Like we recently had a big fight at the high school that could possibly turn into gun violence. So in that instance, instance, we we talk to them specifically about why we're there. Sometimes we don't. You know, it's that we just come there and we only talk about their future and just build them up. You know, we don't, I don't ask them anything about certain things, um, and I let them know, like, I don't, I'm not here to hear about what you're involved in. I don't really care about what you do. I care about what you do. I want to see you doing something different, but I'm not here for that. I'm here, the first thing we talk about is that dream. Like, what kind of dreams do you have? Some of them never thought about that. You know, we sit there, and I make a note of what their dream is, and then we talk about um, conflict resolution, we talk about trauma, 
you know, what kind of things they've been through. So basically help them and aid them on studying themselves. So the what we want to do is for them to realize themselves what, you know, what they've been through and uh, why, they're, why they're doing what they're doing. But like, for instance, that fight, you know, we, we, we specifically talked to them like, you know, we, I don't want you taking this fight into, into the streets and um, picking up a gun to retaliate. And these customs, it puts a magnifying glass on them. You know, we're letting them know like you are, you know, you are, we have an eye on you. You know, if you do anything and you pick up a gun and shoot somebody, you know, Hopewell is gonna hold you, hold you accountable. And because for one, we already been here and gave you a lifeline. Basically, we're, we're trying to do everything we can to keep you out of jail, to keep you from shooting anybody or being shot. And that pressure alone, I believe, is what really um, is the mo one of the most effective things in doing this. Just letting them know, like, they make them second, second guess shooting, picking up a gun. It's like, well, that law enforcement just came and talked to me, and um, I got this other guy over here that I can call. Um, if I shoot somebody, you know, I'm, they say that I'm going to really get a lot of time. It makes them second, second guess when it's at their doorstep, you know. And um, that's why it's so important to what, what, Reed, what Mr. Reed was talking about, about the small percentage of people. It's only a small percentage of people, so if we direct all of our attention to these small individuals, that's what reduces gun violence. So let me ask, how much of this, um, there are a lot of people involved in this, a lot of layers. How useful is that in terms of accessing resources to solve some problems? I mean, you guys can pick up the phone and say, hey, this is, this is a housing instability, instability situation. Can we fix that? This is, people are hungry, how can we get some resources here? How much of that is this networking resources to solve the problem? Is that a part of it? Yeah, it's crucial. That, and and that's, what, that's the main thing we do to start up. Um, before we even implement the, implemented the program, I just, you know, I went around and met everyone in the community, the churches. Um, I have connections at, the, at DMV, the Social Security Office, um, food banks, um, this, a lot of different community members that I can reach out to if I can, because we don't provide all the programs. It's not us, we're, we're mostly a bridge, you know, to be able to connect people. So that's our main job, is to, is to find those resources and find who, who, who is in the community. You know, and, then, and the, the, the National Network of Safe Community, you know, they advise us simple, simple places like DMV to be able to get them in front of the line because a lot of these guys, they want something. They, they might want to get their license or something, but they don't want to wait around to do it. So, you know, that's just the population that we're dealing with. And so if we're there to show them, like, look, we're here to help. I can get you in DMV tomorrow. And they're like, oh, wow, they, he's, you know, they getting stuff done. It, it helps tremendously. So the, 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 um, the resources are very important. So I've got to say, when I visited the Hopewell Police Department, there was a young man who was trying to resolve. He had an outstanding warrant that was being swapped between different jurisdictions. And the receptionist, at, um, whoever was manning the front desk, was calling those different districts and trying to get it straightened out. And she couldn't figure it out either. But I think he really appreciated someone trying to resolve this for him. He was trying to do the right thing, but it's really complicated sometimes. Major Reed, I wanted to ask you, we all have our, idea, our own ideas about what the police do and how they operate. You alluded to this when you were speaking earlier, that this is a shift. This is not the man coming to power down and arrest and punishment. This is actually getting ahead of it with a new approach. I'm curious what you find with, um, what you found in the training with your police officers, kind of getting them to come on board. And what you hear from other police officers in other districts, are they on board, are they resistant? What do you, what do you think? So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're on board or resistant. I, 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 just, I don't think they're educated. I don't think they understand the meaning um, behind the programming. Um, it's often hard for law enforcement agencies, especially an agency head, uh, saying, I'm defeated, I need help. You know, because that kind of, uh, it goes upon everything we're, we were trained to early on in our careers. However, there has been a shift in law enforcement. Um, as we've seen over the 
course of the last few years, the murder of George Floyd. Uh, it's that those things did damage. And communities that, where agencies don't focus on that community and those relationships, they suffered. We were fortunate in Hopewell. Yes, we've had a, a spike in 2022, but prior to that, we were on a, a downward uh, spiral or of crime reduction, and we were very, very uh, proud of that. However, we were nervous when these things did occur, but it, it comes back to those relationships that um, we work so hard to build. You know, when I hire an officer, I explain to them, I'm hiring you as a community police officer. That's, that's your job. Your job is to build relationships with the area you police. I want you to know the business owners. I want you to know the churches. I want you to know the residents. So when you respond to those calls for service, they know you by name. You know, one thing we changed in our policy is traffic stops. I expect you to introduce yourself on a traffic stop. I don't care what the infraction is. When you walk up to the window, I want you're a person. You're not a police officer. You are a person, and I want you to introduce yourself. That goes a long ways. I've been doing it for years because people respect. I would rather interact with somebody who's upset and introduce myself and just squash that, break, break, break the ice immediately and show that I'm, 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 I'm just a human just like they are. And it just is a better outcome. So um, we've, small steps like that increases our opportunities. But engagement, uh, we created a barbecue uh, a, a series. Um, and that's how we got Maurice and their team to introduce uh, or be introduced to our community. We went into each ward. Uh, we had a, a final kickoff uh, or a, a national, night out, national night out kickoff barbecue. It's a mouthful. And um, they came to every single one of them. Uh, they were introduced to the uh, community members in that ward. Uh, any uh, counselors, anyone that came and attended, they met real life. They met the police department. They saw the relationship between real life and the police department. And we're forever grateful for that because we would not be successful with Project Safe if it wasn't for real life. They have that credibility piece. They've, they've had the time to help us structure this and give us the direction behind it. We're just along for the ride. And we are very, very thankful because of the impact we are seeing in our community. Um, so uh, it's everything we do, we're in a person's business. It's all about relationships, you know. Um, one of the guys that works with real life, uh, D. Archie Lewis, is a close friend of mine. Um, I used to chase D. Archie in the street and have arrested him for drug distribution years ago. And uh, he is uh, sober, I want to say, nine years now. Um, he works hand-in-hand -hand with the police department, runs a, a peer recovery center in our city, and also a sober living house. You know, those are the things that we want. Me and D. Archie talk regularly. We were just together this morning doing shop with a cop, um, and he was there helping. Um, so I want all our officers to have that same mindset and understand that we're not. So where our crime rates have dropped, so have our arrests. So our, arrest. our arrest numbers have reduced. Our traffic stop numbers have reduced. A lot of our enforcement numbers have reduced. And I think that is success. That's a measurable that we can use to, be, to show success from what we're doing. Project SAFE has been instrumental in crime reduction, and we'll talk about some stats here shortly regarding that piece. But I think the, the police officers be now becoming educated onto what we're trying to do and how we're building those relationships and seeing the success come from that, you know, it's, it's great. So I always wish we had a million more minutes of time, but I do want to ask, St. Paul's is a faith community, and many people at St. Paul's feel called to help reduce gun violence. Um, you mentioned churches earlier. What is the role of people of faith or churches as institutions in this framework? Do you see a place for them? Absolutely. So, um, and you want to talk on community resilience at all? Okay. So part of that will be community re resilience, but also we utilize our faith-based community as a resource. Um, it may be someone from the faith-based faith -based community that comes on a custom notification. And hence the word custom, as he spoke to earlier. Each notification is different. It has to be personalized. So if it is a member of congregation, we may have the pastor or, or someone that's bought in come and do that custom notification with to, to help that introduction and create that credibility for real life to uh, move it forward. So there's definitely quite a, quite a few or quite a bit of role for uh, the churches and uh, especially in our community resilience piece that we add into this. Yeah, um, and it's important for, for the congregation to know exactly what's going on because someone in the congregation might can offer one of the guys a job or, or have, have another resource that they could use, you know. Um, 
But other than that, like, like Reed mentioned, um, the custom notifications are, are great for that. And the resilience, the resilience team. So the, resi the resilience team is our second part that we have. And, we, and they're called resilience ambassadors. The individuals that go out whenever there's a shooting in the neighborhood. So if someone is shot or someone, you know, if someone is, is killed, you know, or it might be a shooting to a house, we go into that neighborhood and we go to directly to that house and we knock on all the doors in the vicinity. And we just come and let them know that we care. We're, you know, if someone died, we know we tell them we're sorry about the loss in the community and, and that we care. And everyone is, goes through training um, who, who's part of the Resilience Ambassadors. We give free trauma training. It's like a seven to eight hour training course to have, make sure everyone is in, informed with, with um, trauma informed, can see through trauma lens. So um, we're able to interact with those who, who are affected. And that has been just awesome. Just, they just love that, we, that we're there. You know, after a shooting, somebody's being shot and we're just there. It just, you know, a lot of them are just in awe. Like, oh, so y'all just came around because someone was shot? Uh, yeah, that's why we're here. You know, if you need somebody to talk to, we give them the resources um, so that, that they can reach out. And, and that's what we do whenever there's a shooting in the neighborhood. So that's, and that's one part that um, we have a pastor out from our whole world that comes with us sometimes, that, that comes with us on, the, um, on those walks. So. Thank you. Hey, community you have some stats, and then I want to get some questions from the audience. How about if I set up your slides? Yeah, please do. And uh, regarding the, the peace walks that our community resilience ambassadors do, we also have a, a foundation in the department. We call it a neighborhood reset. So not only are they meeting with us face-to-face, -face, they're meeting with our uh, resilience ambassador. So they're getting a, a, a quite a bit of attention over the course of the next week to two weeks after a, a traumatic incident does occur in their, uh, in their neighborhood. So, all right, so we started in June of 2023 um, and through November of uh, 2023, we've seen a 67% uh, reduction in shooting incidents. And that's compared to uh, June of, uh, 2022 through November of 2022. So since the institution of uh, Project SAFE, 67% reduction in that gun violence piece. Um, we are currently 36, 37% down in violent crime as well in 2023. So it's been a very successful year. We still got room to improve, room to grow, but uh, much better off than what we were in 2022. Um, as you see, there was 19 victims uh, during that same stretch, as opposed to what we've had now. Uh, six victims. That's, that's huge for us. That is absolutely incredible. Um, 34 custom notifications during that time frame from Maurice and his team. And then 18 individuals currently working with Real Life through Project Safe for the resources piece, um, helping uh, kind of remove them from that lifestyle. Um, and that, I think that's major. 18 of 34 is pretty impressive. Um, and then as we talked about the Peace Walks, our community uh, resilience ambassadors have visited 915 homes in the course of uh, those several months that we've been running Project Safe. Um, and then kind of a little bit, to talk a little bit further about what we're working on now, you heard him talk about our shooting reviews. We had Chesterfield, Prince George, Petersburg now involved. Our goal is to spread Project Safe, group violence intervention into the Tri-Cities. They've already got them in Richmond Housing here, but in our general area, the affected area for us, where a lot of what we see, there's no boundaries for crime. Um, you know, Petersburg and Hopewell share a lot of same issues. Um, now that they're at the table, we're hoping that we can incorporate the Project Safe in fully into their jurisdictions. And that way, they can reap some of the same rewards. And, uh, and we've gotten a lot of uh, support so far um, from them regarding this. So uh, this could be huge uh, for the Tri-Cities. We could see some, some big things happen in 2024. Um, additionally, we're working on a, a, a location in, uh, for them uh, in Hopewell uh, to be housed so they can bring folks indoors into their building. It may have a rec room. It may have a game room for kids. Um, we're, we're trying to get that piece set up as well so they kind of have a home base to work out of and they're not running back and forth to Richmond, so. You said you'll take questions? 
Yes, please. I would. Who has a question? I'll bring the microphone to you. One, two. On the resiliency piece, what you've described and the interactions, continuing interactions you've described, uh, it sounds like to me that's a, a, a life coach, that's a long-term process. Do you yes, have a specific term limit for someone to be involved in the program? And how do you expect to carry this on for years given you've been in existence for six months? Right. We don't, we don't have a cutout, cutoff date. Um, we haven't, we haven't talked, we talked briefly about a cutoff date, but we don't have one. Um, we just, until someone, the, the way we're doing it now, you know, some of our guys are 15, 14 years old, you know, suspected shooters or at, at risk of gun violence or been shot that we're working with. And we don't foresee not, you know, cutting them off anytime soon. So the long, the long term. Where does your funding come from? Uh, we have funding from DCJS as well as, um, I can't answer that. <laughs> you might answer that. State and federal grant funding. Uh, nothing's come from our municipalities. Everything's been funded uh, through the Department of Criminal Justice, Department of Justice. We had another question from a member of the committee about the initial funding outlay versus the long-term cost of doing nothing, you know, prevention versus paying later. What do you think about that? So right now, um, this is kind of at the forefront um, statewide and, and obviously nationally. Um, the Attorney General's Office just got additional grant funding. I want to say upward to $9 million. Um, so uh, each year there is a gun violence or community um, intervention style uh, uh, grant programming that comes out that we continue to apply for as well as uh, the non from the nonprofit side. DCGS uh, typically does one for sworn and one for nonprofit. They apply as well. So right now we have uh, no funding uh, that's come from um, the city of Hopewell or out of real life's pocket for this. It's all been um, from the grants and, and, and for the foreseeable future that will be the case. And you talked about the uh, longevity of the program itself. Uh, that was one of our main uh, talking points when we were kind of kicking around the creation of this and that's why the executive board was put in place is to ensure that long after I'm gone um, and long after you know Lieutenant Allen who is kind of our, 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 our person our point of contact for real life is gone that this program is still in place so that is built so uh, and I think one of the steps we're going to utilize with that is we'll, we'll probably do an annual training regarding that to get the people that are coming up the ladder on our end uh, through that. Um, we haven't built that piece into yet or brought National Network back in for that. But um, yes, the, we are, we're, we're, the framework, the foundation was built for longevity because if this goes away, I guarantee you we'd see a dramatic increase. Everything that we worked so hard to reduce, we would see increased. So... That's obviously a goal of ours. And um, on on that note too, another another longevity piece. These guys we're working with, you see these 18 guys that we're working with out there. Um, the the original method of lot that that a lot of police been doing, or, you know, across the country is is locking them up. Like in the country, a lot of people just lock them up. They coming home, you know. They might come home 10 years from now, 15, 20, five. And they're coming out, coming home worse than they were, you know. So, this is very big, you know. Being able to change these guys' lives, change their way of thinking, is better than sending them to prison and coming home. Some of them you might change their way of thinking; they still might get involved in something, but they still have a different, different way of thinking, and they'll come out, come home better than with no intervention. So, I feel that's important. Hi, I'm Angela Lockridge, and I'm actually a, an educator in Henrico County Public Schools. And so I have two questions because this is very personal for me. Um, every year I've been teaching, I've lost at least one student that I've taught to gun violence of some form. So I'm interested in, again, two questions. One, please tell me that there has been some talks in between, um, you know, Henrico County 
Yes. Thank you. Um, I met with and, the city council, everybody up there. Okay, so there is hope. Okay, thank you. And um, secondly, are you seeing are you seeing the ages of either gun violence victims or um, those who commit gun violence getting younger? Or what is the average age? Yes, I will tell you from 21 to uh, 22, um, where we were seeing that 19 to 23 year range was from 13 to 17. Um, so a part of, yes, yes, horrible. So when, prior to uh, starting um, group violence intervention, we actually, um, I wrote a grant for a youth intervention program. We were awarded $143,000 from uh, the Department of Criminal Justice Services, and we created a youth intervention program where, because our schools are now year-round, so during the intercessions, we get the students that have been uh, sent to us from the school boards or the courts for uh, a week straight, and then we follow up with them and meet with them on uh, four additional Saturdays, and then we graduate them from our youth intervention program. Uh, once they graduate, they become alumni, and then they can uh, elect to come back and work with us. Um, we've also uh, had some job force assistance where we were able to get uh, some of our youth some jobs, um, and uh, we have seen uh, great success from that. I want to say about 90% of uh, the, our school recommendations have not reoffended in school, have not been suspended or not. Um, it's not a scared straight, scared straight program. Uh, we're taking these children to Kings Dominion and Bush Gardens. Uh, we're buying them bikes and riding the Capitol Trail. Um, we're, we're, we're taking them to a funeral home. We're taking them to, to the jail. We're showing them uh, consequences and, you know, death and jail. Um, but we're building relationships with them. That program is not a police program. It's a community program. We actually have a community member that is our program coordinator. Um, so that's another uh, kind of step we had to take once we started seeing the reduction in age, when we started seeing some more of our youth. Um, I will tell you, uh, one of the children that I was closest to, Cam, um, in our second session, uh, he, he just committed a murder in Prince George County. We were following up with him. We were, I'd go visit him at school. The, if he would, teacher would, if he would have some issues, they would call me directly. Uh, his mom would call me directly. He, ju he just committed a murder in Prince George County. And it's tough. It is absolutely tough. So we're not going to win them all. We're not going to win them all, but it's not going to deter us. It's not going to stop us um, from developing different strategies and taking a different approach. So, so we've reached our bewitching hour. I'm sorry. I think you can catch them on the way out. I, I don't mind if you want to get the last question or if anybody's got a we have something else to okay. at 12.30. <laughs> right. um, I want to let everybody know to mark your calendars. Uh, the next event in the Faith in Action series is Sunday, January 21st. Uh, this will be about criminal justice reform. Sean Weneka is putting that together. And um, probably someone from the governor's office and certainly someone from No Left Turns, which some of you are familiar with. Um, thank you both so much. I promise... <laughs> Really nice to hear good news. If you have anything you want to say on the way out, please feel free. Absolutely. Yeah, I just thank you all for this opportunity. Um, I love sharing what we're doing in Hopewell. I do. Um, I love the partnership we have with Real Life. Um, I know that Richmond and other jurisdictions, other localities are going to see the benefit to this. Uh, when, I don't know, but uh, we're, we're, we're always here uh, and, and to, to share uh, in good news, bad news. We're very transparent regarding uh, what we're doing. Um, so, but thank you all for this opportunity, and I wish you all the best.